lot of talks today, and actually the, the VC in the morning, the VC panel that was here, um, there were some interesting discussions there about where this industry might be going. So this presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit of where I see potential with this industry and where I see the next kind of um, frontier in what, in what is going on. This is just our lawyer's way of saying this is all science, what we're going to talk about. So there's a lot of ifs and maybes and uncertainties, and that's where we are. Very quickly about us, company out of Israel, we've been doing innovative pharmaceutical development for the last 15 years or so, a little bit less, and we do all of the actual chemical development of ideas. So in the R&D world, we do the D side of it, and that's really where our expertise lies. And if we'll talk about psychedelics, I think everyone in this room agrees that we see psychedelics as huge opportunities, right? But those don't come without challenges. And just to name a few of those, we have some safety issues with some of the drugs that we're talking about. We have issues with the length of effect, and we know a lot of companies are trying to deal with length of effect and how that ties into chronic use, how does that tie in into aftercare and monitoring. We talk about specificity, how do we make sure we take the right compound for the right indication? And we obviously talk about controlling and where does it get to? What organ are we trying to target? What indication are we trying to target? What area? But all of those challenges, right, those for me, huge opportunities for places where we as developers, we as researchers can actually impact in this world and create the second and third frontier of what psychedelics are becoming, right? So I think in that VC panel, there was some discussion about modes of administration. We know, we know some, right? We know IV, there's ketamine IV that people are using. Obviously, orally, there's vaping and inhalation. There's nasal administration, the J&J s -ketamine. We know DMT um, nasal administration. And, and each one of those, creates a different way of interacting with the drug, right? The, the dose that we need to administer, the way that it, the onset of the symptoms come about, and I think, again, it was mentioned this morning, those are all places where we can start playing with how do we use those compounds and how do we give it specifically what we're trying to achieve. And this is just a typical curve for opiates, right? But you can see a very, very, very different way of our interaction with our body when administered in different ways. In psychedelics, we actually have a more complex situation, right? In psychedelics, many times we're also concerned about the protocol of treatment and monitoring of the patient while we're giving it. So we're talking about administration, but then if we look at the MAPS protocol, for instance, we're talking about 8 to 12 hours of, of uh, integration and psychotherapy and monitoring, and only then we're talking about releasing the patient out. So if we look at what pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry is doing, any time that it's looking into new novel compounds, new therapeutic cargoes that we're trying to deliver, we all got um, vaccinated, right? The Pfizer vaccinations, Moderna vaccinations, those are all liposomial based. We're, we're trying to give mRNA. So we're adapting the way that we deliver the compound to what we're trying to achieve and to making sure that we create the most efficacious administration. So we're trying to deal with things like improving the stability of the drug, which is, that's an issue with some of the psychedelics. We're looking at targeting specific organs. We're looking at modifying the PK, like I was talking about, modifying the way it interacts with our body, looking at the drug safety profile, looking at the efficacy issues. And if we're all believing here, which I think we can agree on, that psychedelics is an exciting new frontier of this whole new group of molecules that have amazing potential of being new therapeutic frontiers, then we mustn't think about this only to the extent of are we creating it as a nasal spray or an IV or an oral administration, we need to look beyond. 
we need to look into formulation, we, knew, need, we need to look into optimization of the formulation, and really looking at new technologies. Very quickly, I'll tell you what we're doing in this field, and this is just one option of a lot of different things that researchers can do. But we have a delivery system that we've been developing for the last four years. It's a liposomal delivery system. But it's been modified to the extent that it has a targeter attached to it. And that targeter allows us to administer different drugs, different APIs, and we'll talk about a couple of things in a second, in a targeted manner into the brain, through the blood-brain barrier, right? So we'll take a couple of case studies and see where does it lead us. Let's look at the PK that I mentioned. And, and let's look at LSD. If we look at LSD, which is a very interesting compound in our world, we'll see the line, the red line there, is LSD in our brain, right? Post-administration. This is a timeline. The least amount that you see in the nine organs that this profile is showing is in your brain. We know it's very efficacious, but that's the least amount. Where do we see the most amount? The GI tract. Right? It actually gets stuck in our GI tract. And maybe what we see as the length of effect of LSD ties into the fact that it acts almost as a drip. It keeps on going back into our bloodstream. So if that's the case, and we know that our brain is the target organ, do we need to stay with as much LSD as we're administrating if we can bypass the fact that most of it is going to the GI tract? If we're getting it only to where we need it to get, do we need as much? And the other question do we need to ask ourselves is effect equal to efficacy, right? It's that if you look at LSD, on the left, what you see is the administration. On the right, what you see is the subjective effect by the patient. Those are not linear. Those are not necessarily the same. So, do we need as much? Do we need to administer that? We need to optimize what we're giving the patients. And this is an example of what we did with our delivery system on dopamine, unrelated to, to psychedelics, but I'll give you an example to why we're talking about it. In dopamine, in Parkinsonian mice, where we know that dopamine is missing in the brain, we took dopamine and we delivered it, and that's your dopamine ratios in the brain on the timeline. So we know that we managed to bring it to the brain, but, but is that enough? No, we need to ask ourselves, is it also efficacious in the brain, right? This is behavioral um, results where we see that the, it's actually becoming efficacious. We see the mice losing the Parkinsonian symptoms. This is a compound, a psychedelic compound. Well, I, unfortunately, I can't disclose more about this project because it's ongoing. But if you look at the psychedelic compound with our delivery system, the yellow line you're seeing at the bottom is just a free administration of the same psychedelic drug in IV. If you look at the blue line, that's administration with our technology. We actually administered 25% lower dose with our technology than with a free drug. But if you look at the profile in the plasma, in the, in the blood of the, the animals, you see a much higher concentration, right? So what does it tell us? Actually, nothing, right? It, it's, it's missing a lot of other information that we're not disclosing. We're not giving all the pictures here. And this needs to be compiled with a lot of different things. But it does show us that there's an opening, right? There's an opening to manipulating what we're doing with a drug. And it gives us an opportunity to create something new and maybe better for patients. Let's take a second example, ibogaine, right? We know big potential with ibogaine, but we also know that there's an inherent issue with ibogaine relating to cardiotoxicity. And it's creating a situation where there are a lot of companies are deterred from using ibogaine or developing with ibogaine. Uh, regulators are kind of looking at it as we're not sure. We know that ibogaine is creating 
a prolonged QT effect, right? There's less, there's, there's an issue. It blocks the, the, the ability to take some of the needed uh, molecules to, the, to, to our heart. So we at, Next, at, at IMEO, we started a project together with our friends at MindMed. And the whole point of this project is to take ibogaine and reduce the heart exposure to the molecule, reduce that blockage that we're seeing, and potentially increase the safety profile. Now, if we can take ibogaine, which we all think has a lot of potential, and really increase the safety profile, now it's becoming more interesting for regulators. Now it's becoming more interesting for patients. Now it's becoming a real potential. And again, I'll, I'll use another drug and give you an example of what we did on the safety issue with our delivery system. These are mice with tumors, glioblastoma tumors, brain-related tumors. And the mouse on the, on the, on the middle is, is our control. This is the tumor, as you can see it. On the left is a mouse treated with the current treatment for glioblastoma. It's a drug called TMZ. It's a cytotoxic material. Has a lot of side effects outside of our brain. On the right, is a drug treated with the same TMZ, but with our delivery system. So we managed to get it to the brain, we managed to shrink the tumor, but not only that, we managed to reduce the exposure of other organs to that cytotoxic drug, which has direct implications to the lifespan of that animal, right? You see the red line is the same TMZ, free TMZ lifespan, and you see the line all the way to the, to the right, the yellow one, is with our technology. So if we're patients, we want to be on that line, right? We don't want to be on that line. We want to be in the safer area of what we're doing. And I'm, I'm going to use the, the compass, um, the compass uh, study, the, the phase 2B that compass came out in, in November that was greatly timed by microdose because it came out just as Wonderland was happening and it gave us a lot to talk about in Wonderland about the results of that, of that trial. And what did we actually see in that trial, right? That we saw this amazing thing that Compass was telling us about. We saw response to psilocybin and depression and we saw, we saw actually a dose-dependent response that was quite amazing. I, I think it brought, for me as someone who's dealing with this, with this industry and drug development, it was very encouraging. It showed us a lot of potential on psilocybin working. So what's the issue, right? Why was everyone talking about the phase 2B in mixed feelings? Right? There were severe adverse effects, most, most predominantly suicidal ideation, right? self-inflicted injury, about 12, 12 patients. Some of them got to the hospital with that. Now, can we live with that? I, I don't know, maybe. Maybe, the, the, maybe it's, it's good enough of a drug for us to say we are able to accept that, and it's low enough of a percentage for us to say yes. But it also says another thing, right? So it also, it also tells me, at least, that there's a lot of room for what we're doing here in development, right? There's, there's still a lot to be done. There was, a, I think, a notion in the industry that uh, Compass and MindMed, they kind of got there first. Compass got first to psilocybin, through the FDA, through the breakthrough drug, into phase 2B, and they might take over the landscape because they're there first. But what that tells me is that, A, this really works, right? This really works, and there's a lot of potential in that. But B, it's not perfect. It's not as simple as giving psilocybin to patients and hoping 
that we'll be fine. It's not as simple as just giving it. Maybe we can do the patients better. Maybe we can give them a better drug. I'm not saying MDMA, psilocybin, ibogaine, 5-MeO, DMT are not valid treatments today. What I'm saying is, if I'm a patient, I want to be looking for advancement in this world. I want to be looking at the second and third generation of products that can optimize that delivery, that can make it safer, that can make it more efficacious, that can, can make it maybe better for other indications that we're not thinking about yet. And for that, we really need to develop. I, we talked about NCEs in the, in the, in the panel this morning. And, there was a comment about how NCEs are a um, difficult route, right? Someone said six to 10 years. I would probably say 10 to 15 years for an NCE and a very expensive route. But there is a gap between, right? Because what we're doing with ibogaine, for instance, and what we did here is we didn't change the molecule. We didn't take the TMZ, we didn't splice it, we didn't make it something else, because, because then you're compromising the efficacy of that molecule. You're creating an NCE, and you're creating a much longer route. But we shouldn't just put that aside. We can actually optimize that delivery. We can actually make sure that there are better drugs. So what I'm saying, I see a lot of room in this industry, still for development and growth and research, and it's not just in the practitioner protocol uh, or new uh, indication side of things, right? It's really creating better products for people. So with that, I will thank you. And I will um, say that I'm here. I'm here till tomorrow. If you want to talk, feel free. If not, you feel free to contact us. Um, and I'll open the floor for uh, questions, if there are any. Uh, do you think that with uh, an example like you mentioned, the, the Compass Phase II um, studies, if those were administered you know, differently with maybe an advanced formulation but having the same drugs uh, within them, would the results maybe have differed slightly? Or do you think that working with, you know, an extremely uh, sensitive patient group out of the gate is just going to kind of have those impacts on the results overall? I think it's probably a mixture of, of, the, of three things, right? It's a mixture of, yes, it's a sensitive, we don't know what the, chick, the chicken egg story is. We don't know what the, which, com, which comes first, right? It's a sensitive group of patients. And it might be that there were a lot more people with suicidal ideations pre that treatment. So we don't know. But I think also, with the more research we create, and there, there's a project we're actually doing now with a great company out of Israel called Quantalix that is doing advanced brain imaging. And part of what we're doing is we're starting to look at what our brain image looks like pre and post treatment. And when you start looking at that, you start having ideas about, can I group a certain group of people that I know might have adverse effects for a certain treatment? Do I, can I group a certain, amount, a certain group of people that might be better off with MDMA treatment instead of psilocybin? So, so all of those questions start coming about, and formulation plays a huge role in that, because if we can create a better formulation, maybe lesser dosage, but just affecting the target organ, we might find a different result a long time. And just a quick follow-up question. In terms of uh, the, the progress in Israel compared to the rest of the world, we know uh, cannabis science caught on very, very well over there. How, what kind of indications are you seeing in terms of uh, the Israeli field when it comes to psychedelics and how, how much it's expanding compared to the rest of the world? I think the biggest uh, um, um, testimonial to that is the amount of Hebrew you hear here, right? There's, there are a lot of Israelis here, and uh, there's uh, Professor Dedi Meiri who's sitting there, who's uh, been doing a lot of cannabis research throughout the years, and there's a couple of boots from Israeli companies, CyRX are here, and we are here. Israel's always been very, very um, uh, active on the research side of things, right? We are very 
We are very much curious about seeing where this takes us. And I think with the amount of uh, PTSD patients and our previous, the previous talk about PTSD in Israel is such a predominant issue um, that MAPS Israel is just initiating now 50, they just got approval for 50 severe PTSD patients to be treated, not as a, not as a clinical trial, right? Compassionate treatment for 50 patients in Israel fostered by the Ministry of Health, fostered by the Ministry of Defense. So definitely this is something that's, uh, and, and Israel's, MAPS Israel's site was always one of the first and most prominent uh, sites in, Israel, in, in the MAPS trial. So I think Israel is definitely in the forefront of that, yeah.